thanks for introduction. Uh, yeah, but there, there's going to be one like, mathematical equation, actually. Uh, so I'm Mateusz, as Rafał said, uh, and I'm machine learning tech lead at NetGuru. Uh, yeah, and today I'm going to talk about reproducible machine learning, so how we can make machine learning reproducible. Uh, and let's start with the first slide, which is actually was supposed to be different, but yesterday I attended some webinar and I got inspired. So, uh, so I attended a webinar about stock prediction and the one thing uh, I noticed is, because basically it's standard Jupyter notebook with loading data, but uh, there's one thing I noticed. Uh, do you see something? Louder? Yeah, untitled. So, Untitled 16. So, uh, if you ever committed Untitled 16 or a titled X uh, notebook to GitHub repository, please raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, so, we can see on this example that even if small things like naming notebooks, we, are, uh, we don't bother about naming, so how we can bother about actually making sure that the results we obtain in those notebooks are actually reproducible. But before we talk about how we make machine learning reproducible, let's start with some definitions. So what is reproducibility? So I define, uh, actually the authors of the paper define and I define this talk, reproducibility as an ability to reproduce uh, some findings using the same procedures and same data. So basically, in machine learning case, we have probably Dockerized environment. Uh, we have some code base and some data, uh, and we are able to to run everything in the same different uh, environment, same code base with same data, and obtain same results. And preferably, we have also same hardware for this. Uh, the other concept, uh, which is similar, might be confusing to reproducibility, but it's different: is replicability. So. The difference here is uh, we want to apply the procedures from, from different uh, study to, to different data and we want to obtain similar uh, results. So it's something like uh, we do image classification with some neural net architecture uh, and we test whether this architecture improves uh, state of the art on several data sets. Mm. Or other case would be uh, deep learning working on seven Atari games. And the third thing is generalizability. This is a difficult word. Uh, and the whole idea of generalizability is about uh, making the concepts uh, transferring to different domains. So, so in, in my mind, example is for uh, attention layer, which works in NLP and, and works in computer vision. But, and, and generalizability is something that we want to aim in research, but we already have problems with reproducibility. So, uh, some time ago, Nature conducted a survey asking scientists, uh, do they think that there is a reproducibility crisis in, uh, in, in science in general? And almost 90%, or exactly 90%, yeah, scientists think that there is, uh, and more than 50% think that this is huge crisis. But it's not the most horrific fact here because they ask actually the follow-up question. Mm. Something's wrong. Okay. Uh, yeah, misclick. So they ask follow-up question. Mm. Have you failed to reproduce your experiments or someone else? And the really horrific fact is like uh, for each of subfields, we have more than 50% people saying that they failed to reproduce their own research. So it's, for me, it's crazy because how the research might be of any significance if we can't actually reproduce it, even our own research. So I don't have better words to describe the situation that this is basically madness. And now I have a question, is it that bad in machine learning? So Julien Pinot, who 
gave a great talk at ICLR in 2018 about reproducibility in reinforcement learning, conducted a survey on, on some workshops she conducted uh, uh, between machine learning engineers, machine learning researchers, and the findings are similar. Most of machine learning engineers said that there is significant reproducibility crisis also in machine learning. And uh, is it actually true? And I'd say yes, because if you're a common Reddit visitor, you can read a lot of themes that some people are trying to reproduce results uh, of papers. Or, uh, and, and there is always this question, how, how this paper can be even validated if, there, if it's lacking data and code. Uh, and probably you had often that situation that you went to some GitHub repository that is supposed to solve your problem and it actually doesn't or the, um, the metrics that are reported, you always achieving them lower on, or you just can't run the code. But is it just the case for, uh, for, for some researchers who just posting the GitHub uh, papers and they are not maybe on the best conferences? Actually, it's not. And uh, there is that paper from Nature about AlphaGo. So probably ov all of you heard about AlphaGo an alpha zero beating uh, Lee Sedol, who was world champion in Go. And actually that paper has, as of yesterday, more than 6,300 citations. And actually there is no data, there is no code, there is no uh, details about hyperparameters or computational resources or even evaluation setup. So we have that paper which was cited more than 6,000 times uh, about probably one of the most famous machine learning algorithms right now. Uh, and when, it's, when it was published, it was completely not reproducible in any way by other researchers who are not from DeepMind. But it's not the problem wh which actually exists only now, because uh, some of you might know the last uh, Fermat theorem. So the theorem uh, was that no three positive inter integers, a, b, and c, satisfy the equation a to the power of n plus b to the power of n equals c to the power of n for any integer value greater than two. And Fermat apparently wrote on, on the margin that uh, the proof is surprising and interesting, but there is not enough space on the margin to, to fit the proof. Uh, and it took only 358 years to prove the proof to publish a proof. So so the problem, uh, it's not only now, it was much earlier in the science. But what are the specific reasons for machine learning that we have some, so many difficulties with achieving reproducibility? So the first one, quite trivial, machine learning is very fast evolving. Everyone who follows machine learning knows that every Monday morning when you just check your machine learning newsletters, you read about new generative adversarial network. The second thing is that research is funded all, uh, usually by uh, groups of commercial interest, so they don't release a model, or they don't release the training data, or they don't release the, uh, the data, or just they don't release anything. Uh, the usual problem in the research community is data dredging. Uh, and the problem I want to talk about today more is that we lack uh, MLOps culture, so basically DevOps culture in machine learning community. So we don't uh, do data versioning and we don't manage our experiments in a reproducible manner. So this is typical machine learning pipeline. So we have data engineering phase, uh, then we have some training, uh, then we do deployment, and we go back again to data engineering, training, and basically we iteratively building models. And once we go on through that loop, it's one experiment, and everything should be actually stored, uh, all information about that experiment so we can reproduce it. So information like what was the Python version, what were the versions of libraries, so maybe the Docker image, uh, what metrics we achieved, what was the seed, for random numbers generator, and so on. But one does not simply remember those experiments, so 
Uh, and now I would uh, tell you a story from not so much a long time ago when I uh, run experiments uh, on neural networks that were supposed to memorize the data. So uh, there was this paper uh, like three, four years ago by Yushua Benjo with that surprising fact that if you train uh, your neural networks for long enough on completely random labels, you can achieve 100% training accuracy with 10% uh, with, with random, so for CIFAR, uh, with 10 classes, for example, 10% accuracy on the test set, so basically random. So neural networks are able to fit completely random labels. And I was reproducing that experiment, uh, and I wanted to make sure later that uh, I know the sequence of the randomized labels, so I basically randomized them once, and I stored that in file, which then at some point I deleted. So uh, I wasn't able really to reproduce the results uh, because I didn't store that information somewhere in the cloud, in in some in some maybe in some tool that uh, tracks that. So uh, let's carry on, and so the combination of machine learning and DevOps. So it's called MLOps, and basically it's practice of operationalizing and managing the life cycle of ML system in production. Uh, and what is the goal of DevOps? So the DevOps uh, started, I think, in 2009, and at the time, just Hamble coined the term continuous delivery. And continuous delivery is the ability to get changes of all types into production safely and quickly and in a sustainable way. And what kind of changes do we have in, in machine learning? So the first change is code. So it's the same like in standard software engineering. We change the code uh, according to the business requirements. Uh, we change the code when we need to fix some bugs. Uh, but what are the other things that change within machine learning? So the first thing is data, and the other, uh, and the other is model. So the data might have different schema after some time. Uh, the data distribution might change over time, and the data volume might change over time. And with models, we might try different algorithms. Uh, the training environment might change. The versions of libraries might change. So for example, in PyTorch 1.1, batch norm was initialized from uh, uniform distribution in PyTorch 1.3, it's initialized as a vector of ones and it makes huge difference in training. And it's easy to, uh, to just omit. So we need some tools to, uh, to manage those changes in data and in model. So the first thing I'm going to talk is how we address changes in data, how we do data management. And here I have some quote from paper actually, that if data replaces code in ML systems and code should be tested, then it seems clear that some amount of testing of input data is critical to a well-functioning system. And basic sanity checks are useful as more sophisticated tests that monitor changes in input distributions. So if we test code, we should then test also our data. And in software engineering, we have some principles about managing changes in code. So the first one is we use Git or different version control systems, but probably all of you use Git. Uh, we have clean and explicit interfaces between services. So there are those, there are those patterns of microservices, for example. Uh, we unit test and integration test our modules, and we monitor uh, our code, how it behaves on production. And we might have the same, we might have equivalence of that in data engineering, so in data managing. So the data should be versioned. S so so we somehow we need to know on what kind of data exactly some model was trained, on what kind of data it was tested. Uh, the other thing is we need clean interfaces between data and code. So Preferably, we have just some class in the code uh, that we ha can access data, and it's not like we uh, implement over and over again some loading of the data from, from the directory or from some cloud storage. Uh, we should 
have some data quality and schema checks. Uh, and we should check, check whether we don't have data regression over time, especially if we have some system in a production. And those things we address at NetGuru with Kilt, which is basically interface to S3 uh, storage, but it's going to support in near future also GCP buckets. So Kilt allows us to share data at scale. Uh, it, uh, it is basically interface to S3, which is connected to Elasticsearch, so data is searchable through Elasticsearch. Uh, and it provides immutable versions of data sets, which is very important for doing uh, machine learning. And it allows also to broaden our access to data within an organization. So let's look at example of Kilt, how we can use Kilt. So uh, it's very simple, basically. So we import Kilt, uh, then we create the package of Kilt. Maybe I can, oh, yeah. So we can set the path to the, uh, to the local directory. Uh, and we can then, uh, we can also set some meta metadata here. And basically, we push uh, our packages with push function uh, on the code on the package to the S cloud storage. So, so the code is very simple. It's basically interface to S3, but it allows us to uh, to version data and to, in easy, simple form, uh, to address that changes in data if our, in our continuous delivery pipeline. So the second thing is experiment management. Mm, and that's a bit uh, bigger thing than just data versioning. Uh, so we need to address a couple things here. So the first thing uh, is tracking. So we need to track uh, experiments. It's difficult to track because we need to store all the metrics, uh, all the models. Sometimes we need to store some immediate uh, layers of the models. Uh, and it's also difficult to reproduce uh, the results. Uh, and there are some custom ML platforms but obviously there is no holy grail. So at NetGuru we use PolyAxon and MLflow. And PolyAxon is the framework which runs on top of Kubernetes to manage experiment cycle. It's similar to Kubeflow. Uh, there are just some detailed differences, but, bas but basically there are those two are uh, competitors. And we also uh, introduced MLflow, which is more lightweight. Uh, version of experiment management system. And I'll dig more here into MLflow. So MLflow has three main components. Uh, the first one is tracking, the second one is projects, and the third one is models. So the tracking, uh, with MLflow tracking, we have a goal to store all the information about the training. So hyperparameters. Uh, parameters after the uh, after epoch, for example, if we need it, some snapshots of models. Uh, also, the metrics, so, so we can later, or even during the training, connect to the tensor board and draw, for example, learning curves. Um, MLflow projects is basically interface uh, for deploying uh, machine learning models from different frameworks. So it's basically abstraction for a machine learning model. And MLflow models uh, is the way of storing the model. So let's uh, look at the MLflow tracking first. So the whole, of, uh, whole idea of MLflow tracking component is that we can have uh, our code in completely different environments. So Jupyter notebooks, some local apps, uh, cloud jobs, and we can connect MLflow tracking to all of them. Uh, and then we have MLflow UI that we can see, for example, a kind of leaderboard between models, how they perform, and we have also API to, uh, to access the details of our experiments from MLflow UI, which can be hosted on premise, it can be hosted on Databricks or, or any server actually. 
uh, yeah, so key components of uh, ML tracking. So the first one is parameters. Parameters is the way to, to store uh, things that we have some keys and values. So for example, hyperparameters of training. Mm, the second component of ML flow is metrics. So things like accuracy, precision, recall, and so on. Uh, we have also artifacts uh, that, for example, model snapshots. Uh, and we have also version of commit from git uh, and source, which is basically code base. And here, there is example how, how easy it's actually to uh, inject MLflow into the training code on the scikit-learn. So first we need to start with, uh, with clause, which is context manager in Python. And when you uh, execute that statement, the new run of some experiment starts. So it might be, if you run it twice, there are just two different runs. Because basically MLflow aggregates experiments first, and experiment has one to many relation with runs. So you can set experiment name on MLflow, uh, and al also you can set uh, some run ID, but there are some def defaults generated. But basically with, uh, when you get into that with close, you just start the, the new run, which is uh, connected uh, one to many to your experiment. Uh, then you have standard scikit-learn code for fitting some data. Uh, and instead of using those prints, which are just going to STD out, uh, you can lock parameters here with MLflow, uh, and you can lock metrics with MLflow. And those metrics and those parameters goes to the uh, either, so if you run MLflow locally, there is MLruns file where all of those are stored, uh, typically on, in YAML files, but it also might be connected to Databricks or just uh, some cloud bucket. The other thing is MLflow projects, which is uh, interface for uh, MLflow for ML model for machine learning model specification. So MLflow project consists of code, configuration of that code, and the data version that it should run, uh, and it might be executed when, wherever you want. So ML project is a convention to describe the code, and it's the YAML file. And with ML project, you usually have also that uh, Conda YAML, which describes your environment. But you might also have Docker here. So it's even better if you have Docker, and it's uh, easier to reproduce. And here are example files of ML, uh, ML project and, and Condayam. So uh, in ML project you have entry point called main, and the entry point is something that you can uh, call with ML, uh, MLflow client interface and execute on some remote machine. So it ba basically shows what comment is, is run on that machine. Uh, with what, par what parameters that uh, this entry point have and what command is run here. And the last thing is uh, MLflow models, so the format to storing data. So we might have different machine learning models from different frameworks, from TensorFlow with PP format, from scikit-learn, which are usually saved to Pico, uh, and they should be run on completely different uh, environments. So for example, some just dockerized environment on your on-premise machine or on Spark or some cloud service. So what MLflow does, it defines the format uh, for uh, generic format for model storage. So basically it's one YAML file which has two uh, two entry points which are important. The first one is uh, describing the model. Uh, so it's the version of environment which was used to, to run the model. And the other one is Python function which can be executed in any Python environment. Uh, and it's, uh, it tells how to load the model. 
So you have that YAML file plus the binary file of the model, and it's everything you need to deploy with MLflow to the uh, to some on-premise machine or to the cloud providers which are currently supported by MLflow, like Databricks or Google Cloud or AWS. Yeah, so s summing up, uh, Achieving re reproducibility is not really easy, but we have already a lot of frameworks to do that. And it's actually a good first step because once you have a lot of code, in in a lot of machine learning code base, it's not so easy to, to introduce the tools. But if you just start with, uh, from the beginning with things like MLflow, they're quite easy to inject. It's not much overhead. Uh, and then it's much easier for you to reproduce the code and, and to not have those moments then you deleted something and, and you need after, for example, one year, run, run it again. So uh, there are some alternatives to MLflow, Polyaxon, and, and Kilt, of course. So the Kubeflow is the one of them, uh, or the, uh, the VOC, yeah. Uh, and I encourage you to, to try them out and choose the best that suits, uh, suits your problem. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mateusz. Questions to our speaker? Any question about tools? Oh, sorry, there's a there's a light, so I couldn't see that. Hi. Uh, I also think that this is a huge issue in data science. So imagine that we train a model locally, and you've said that MLflow saves this to a file. Uh, is there any way to then reinitiate and like a framework automatically sends the results to the API, and then I can, after some part of being offline, see the results, or do I have to do it manually? Yeah, so basically if you if you have or uh, you can configure at the beginning MLflow to send it to some cloud, for example, and and if it's configured for the cloud, then it doesn't store it locally at all. But if it was, for example, if you didn't have I don't know internet connection, and you just wanted to run on your uh, device some experiments, then you have uh, command line interface to export that file to the cloud. Thanks. One more question? No? Nope. Yeah, there's one. Um, uh, the way which you showed us, um, just a moment, <laughs> uh, requires uh, an additional uh, person in your project. For example, uh, ML Ops. But uh, why? You don't recommend only use DVC for us because uh, you can create a, a an reproducible pipeline uh, due to only two commands, DVC run, and uh, if you want to reproduce, you can use uh, DVC repro, and that's all. <laughs> Why uh, you choose uh, this uh, uh, hard way? Okay, so. I'm not sure if it's hard way, but yeah, it's to assess on your own. Uh, to be honest, I haven't, I, I don't know very much DVC, so maybe you're right, and maybe I should check it out. Uh, what I heard about DVC that there are some difficulties with data, with the data management in DVC, uh, but it's just what I heard from from a friend. I didn't check it out, you know, like on my own, so maybe I should try it out. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>